All right, so this is Psalm 4, part 2. And in Psalm 4, verses 1 through 8, I'm just going to go ahead and read it again. We read it again, uh, read it last time, but I'll read it again just to remind us. And this is very likely Christ. Well, you know, I like to tell people when Christ says, you know, the Psalms speak of me, I like to tell people this. And you might get tired of hearing it, but I say that the Gospels are the words and actions of Jesus. And the Psalms, many of them, are the thoughts of Christ during his ministry and in his kingdom. So during his ministry, he experienced rejection. He experienced accusations. He experienced mocking and uh, obviously physical pain. Um, but most significantly, the Bible says he became sin. He did not sin. He became our sin, 2 Corinthians. The Bible says God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, he was the spotless lamb of God, to become sin for us so that we would become the righteousness of God. And we, we say that that's the greatest transaction in human history. That Jesus, based upon nothing we've done, says, I'm giving you all my righteousness and I'm going to take your sin and move it as according to Psalm 103 as far as the east is from the west. So here's, I believe that this is Christ praying, answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. He knew that, you know, all his righteousness when he was here on the earth came from God. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me, hear my prayer. Remember, Jesus was praying, he was, and he was in distress. Remember that? A lot of distress in the garden. Be gracious to me. Hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words? And we, sh we showed how uh, Jesus spoke of the Pharisees, that this is a prophecy of the Pharisees. And they were drawing near with their lips, saying, oh, you know, we love God. But he said their hearts were far from him, and they worshipped him in vain. And so they were always picking on everybody else, calling them sinners, accusing, right? Uh, and you remember uh, false accuser? Remember what the Greek word is for false accuser? Diabolos, where we get the word diabolical, where we get the word devil. The Greek word is devil. So Jesus was saying, you Pharisees, you're false accusers. That's why he called them what? what what's one of the, what is the, uh, the living being that the devil is compared to? A, a snake, right? And he called the Pharisees what? Offspring of vipers, offspring of snakes. And in other words, they, that, is, that is devilish. That's diabolical to accuse Christ, to accuse Christ's people when they've been cleansed by his blood. And that's why we too have to be careful about our words. <clears throat> How long will you love vain words and seek lies, but know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself? And by the way, it's kind of interesting here. This word faithful is singular. It's Christ. He was the faithful one. That's why you see in the New Testament, it's called the faith of Christ. In other words, when we have faith, it's because he has given us faith. The Bible says that faith is a gift. It has been given to you, Philippians 1.29, not only to believe, but also to suffer, right? Acts 3.16 clearly says faith is a gift. The Lord hears when I call him. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Offer sacrifices of righteousness. That's the New Testament, right? It's no longer animals. Christ put all that away with one sacrifice. The Bible says he, 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 it was once a once for all sacrifice. He put an end to sacrifice. Hebrews 9 and 10. Put your trust in the Lord, he tells us. There are many who say, Oh, that we might see some good 
Let the what? Light of your face. Or you could substitute presence or countenance. Let the light of your face, presence, countenance, shine on us. Remember, number six. O oh Lord, you have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and wine abound. In other words, it's a joy that has nothing to do with financial prosperity. I will both lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, Lord, make me lie down in safety. All right, so we're going to look at this. Let the light of your face shine on us, O oh Lord. So they're looking forward to this. Remember, this is, is that mine? Oh, okay. Um, so they're, they're longing for the day when God would be with them, when the, he would accept them into his presence. And of course, by the time you get to Ephesians, it says he has made us accepted in Christ. He has accepted us. It was untrue in the Old Testament. Again, no one could go into the holy place. No one. That high priest, but once a year, but no one else. So there's huge transformation. It was world changing. It was world changing. Okay. All right. Okay. So here's, here's the problem under the Old Testament. He says, See, the Lord's hand is not too short to save. He's not saying that he's unable to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Rather, your iniquities or sins have been barriers. So this was the problem under the Old Testament. They were barriers between you and your God. And your sins, watch this, your sins have hidden his face from you, from hearing. So that was the problem under the Old Testament. Separated from God. But he would allow the high priest in there. Isaiah 64, remember this. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived. Now mind you, this is 700 years before Christ. No eye has seen any God beside you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But, of course, that didn't happen. Jesus was the only one who fulfilled that. But you were angry. We sinned because you hid yourself. We transgressed. In other words, they had already sinned. His face was hidden. And of course, if God's face is hidden, what's going to happen? We continue transgressing. We have all become like one who is unclean. And I don't know if you've ever seen any movies where, you know, you'd have someone, you know, a story about the gospel or maybe during the time of Moses and someone maybe had leprosy. And what was one of the things that they had to do if they had leprosy? Yeah, they had to yell down the road, unclean, unclean, right? I'm unclean, stay away, so that people wouldn't get unclean. And even the woman, right? Even the woman who went through her monthly cycle, she was unclean for seven, I think it was seven days. And you couldn't touch her doorknobs. You couldn't touch, you know, it's all under the old covenant. It wasn't because God was misogynistic. That's not it. That's not what this was about. It's not because women were worse. What because he told a lot of things about guys, too. <laughs> I mean, it is some graphic stuff. If you look in like Hebrews oh, 13 through, or, sorry, Leviticus 13 through 16, he talks about all the stuff that's in us that comes out. He says, man, it's just, it's representing something far deeper. So many people focus on, oh, yeah, well, that's bad stuff that comes out. No, no, that's not what God was saying. Not at all. Remember the disciples, or the uh, Pharisees, why do your disciples eat with, without washing their hands? Remember that? And Jesus says, not what's outside that defiles a person. He says, it's what's inside, from within, out of the heart, Jesus says. Proceed all blasphemy, fornication, adultery, murder. It goes on and lists all these sins, right? So that's basically what the book of Leviticus does is it lists all the sins that we all do all the time. There's no difference. He names them all off. He goes through, I mean, he talks about, you name it. He talks about 
bestiality, he talks about adultery, he talks about stealing, lying, cheating, all these things that our hearts uh, conjure and, and contrive. And he says this, we have all become like one who is unclean. And all our, are you ready? Righteous deeds, in other words, all of our obedience under the law, he's saying all of our obedient works, all of our righteous deeds are like a what? Filthy cloth. And this is a bad translation because he's alluding to the woman's menstrual cycle. <laughs> That's the Hebrew word. It means menstrual. Okay, now there are a lot of people who want to soften translations, I realize, to make it not so intense. If you just say it's filthy, the implication is, uh, it, that implies that, well, I got it dirty from somewhere out there. Like, oh, I rubbed my, you know, I rubbed up against a wall and got my, you know, dirt on my sleeve. No, 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 he says, it's, it's like a menstrual cloth. And again, God is not misogynistic. It has nothing to do with that. And he just said, it's like this. We've all become unclean inside. And he says, we all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you. Why? For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of, well, the Pharisees would say our enemies, right? Well, our own iniquity. That's why Jesus said, whoever commits sin is the slave of sin. But if the Son, therefore, shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. And we are, we're free. And we're saying, no, I, but I still sin. But not in his eyes. He doesn't see you that way. He set you free. The Bible says this, one of the most beautiful verses ever. It says, there is now, therefore, no, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. He looks at you as righteous as himself. You are no longer condemned. That's the new covenant. There's no more condemnation. Psalm 13, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Very likely, again, a prayer of Jesus. How long will you hide your face from me? And we say, well, wait, I thought he hid his face from us, sinners. Well, wait a minute. You remember what Jesus said on the cross? Why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's what Paul meant when he said, he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, right? God, Father, forsook him so that he could be with us. He poured all of our sin on him, poured all of our guilt onto him and turned his face from it. How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain? in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me. O Lord my God, give light to my eyes or I will sleep the sleep of death. So now let's look at this. Light of your face, shine on us, O Lord. They were longing for it. Here it is again, just like number six. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Do not let me be put to shame, O Lord, for I call on you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them be, go dumbfounded to Sheol. And again, I believe he's speaking about those Pharisees. Let the lying lips be stilled that speak insolently against the righteous with pride and contempt. And by the way, just for the record, that word righteous there is singular. It's not plural. This is about Jesus. It was their attacks, their vicious attacks against Jesus. With pride and contempt, oh, how abundant is your goodness. 
that you have laid up for those who fear you and accomplished for those who take refuge in you. That, I believe, is predicting the cross in the sight of everyone, in the shelter of your, what? Presence. Parim, panim. In the shelter of your face, in the shelter of your presence, you hide them from human plots. What did Paul say? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Who will accuse us? The Bible says because of Christ's death, it says the accuser is cast down. No one can accuse you. They can't bring up your past. They can't bring up your present. They can't bring up your future. I and mean, we all have a past and a present and a future. We're all going to wake up tomorrow and do something we shouldn't be doing. Whatever it is, doesn't matter. God, God doesn't rank. He never does that, right? He's not ranking sins. Paul, and that's why the Apostle Paul says, what then? Are we better than they are? No, in no way. Both Jew and Gentile, apart from Christ, are under sin, right? So he says, in the shelter of your face, your countenance, your presence, you hide them from human plots. You hold them safe under your shelter from what? Contentious tongues. That's what it boils down to here. And I just started a series at Colfax that will ultimately trickle over here, <laughs> right? We're going to get on board. I just started a series called The Tongue. It's actually called The Church Tongue Singular, right? Because the Bible says the tongue speaks death or it speaks life. It says death and life are in the power of the tongue. But knowing Christ, it keeps us safe. People will bring up our past, and even we, right? Ugh, it's gross, right? We remember things, especially in our lives. You know, think about stuff. I don't know about you, you know, but I, I think about me and some of the stuff that I've done and stuff that I did when I was married and, and with my kids. And man, I, and still things come up to remind me of my past. I have to go back to this. I have to go back to the blood of Jesus and just claim his mercy and grace. Thank you. Thank you for taking care of that 2,000 years ago. The light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You put gladness in my heart. All that stuff, right? So this is the bread of presence, the bread of life. There are many who say, oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your presence face, countenance, shine on us, and notice what is always associated with presence and light in life. What is it? You have put what? Gladness in my heart. So we're associating light, the presence of God with us, with gladness. There's great joy when we focus on what he's done. You know, I... And, and, and some people may disagree with this. And I, and I participated in this when I was an early pastor. And I'm so sad about it. And that's one of those things, one of those regretful things that I live in. But I was one of those uh, taking the, this turn or burn message to God's people, to the church, bringing in legalism and judgment and fear and I'll tell you what, I did it through this idea of, of extreme moralism, right? Do this or you must not be a Christian. And then all of a sudden, all those areas where I pointed the finger, I fell in all of them. And God threw, providentially, through those falls, awakened my eyes to see his mercy and his grace. I was looking at all the judgment passages, at all the fear ones, you know, manipulation. You know what the Bible says in John, what? Perfect love, what? Say that louder. Perfect love casts out fear. God is love in the same book. Remember that. God is love and he's perfect love. And his perfect love gets rid of our fear. He says, fear brings what? Torment. So when we're focusing on our past or our present, we're worried about the things we've done, 
It's very easy to be feel to feel torment. But what happens when you focus on the love of God? That's right. He says, God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Man, that brings joy to my heart. You know, that's why I do what I do. That's why I do what I do because, man, I, I can be a little rascal, <laughs> you know? And, and when I go back to the word of God, it's like, oh, thank God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And it, it really is. I, I know I'm probably like a broken record. Uh, it, it, when, when, I, when I recall these things, it, uh, it reminds me, you know, it reminds me of what he's done. But when I'm not in the word of God, when I stay out of it, that's why Job, even Job said back in the Old Testament, he says, I've considered your word more necessary than my daily food, <laughs> right? Well, it's just, you know, I bring this example up all the time with, with, with spouses. If you take, if, if you have a guy uh, or, or a girl and they're married and, and, and they travel for two weeks, man, it's a breach, it's intense, and, and it's, not, it's not always healthy. Imagine that. If you had to sit there and say, wow, well, I, uh, God's going to go away for a while. You know, Jesus is going to leave me for a while. No, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, Hebrews 13. So the light of his face, shine, presence, gladness, you've put it in my heart, more than when they're grain and wine abound. Now watch this. This is so amazing. I keep the Lord always before me. It's definitely Jesus talking because this is quoted in the book of Acts as Jesus talking. I keep the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure for you do not give me up to the grave or let your faithful one, see, it's Jesus, see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence, there is, what do you think is the next phrase? In your presence, there is fullness of joy. You will show me the path of life. Well, so what does Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life the way no one comes to the Father, his presence, but by me. Well, now we've come to the Father by Jesus. And in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And by the way, that Hebrew word there, and this is kind of, lead, it's, it's, there's such cool connections in the Bible. That Hebrew word there for fullness is a term that is related to eating, right? It's like when we say, I'm full. I'm very full, <laughs> right? I mean, you can and think about this for a second. Think about this. And this is true universally. Maybe a little more true here in the United States because we are just obsessed with food, me included. <laughs> Have you guys ever heard of the phrase, what, you know how you can just eat a ton, but you still have room for dessert, <laughs> right? Someone introduced me to me the phrase, I still have a yummy tummy. <laughs> right? A yummy tummy. You can eat as much as you want and get so full, but man, if there's some really good pecan pie or some, you know, uh, just something incredible, you know, ice cream on warm peach cobbler. Sorry, I hope I'm not causing anyone to stumble. <laughs> but guess, guess what? So that word fullness means full. And there are some Hebrew scholars who believe that that word pleasures is sweets. Isn't that interesting? It's like he's associated. He's, he's like looking at it. it all, the, all parts of the meal. Like this big, royal, kingly, queenly meal. Well, let's find out what that meal is. Notice the bread of presence and the bread of life. Exodus 25, verse 21. You shall put the mercy seat, here it is, and compare this with uh, Romans 3, 25. You shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark. So triumphing over judgment. And in the ark, you shall put the covenant that I shall give you. So this is when he's giving the old covenant. But he says here, there, where? At the mercy seat, I will meet with you. 
I love the King James translation. This is New Revised Standard. I love the King James. It says there, he's talking to Aaron, the high priest, right? In the holiest of all. And he says, King James says, there I will commune with you. I will commune. I will, I will be with you, together with you. And from above the mercy seat, and from above, from above the two cherubim that are on the Ark of the Covenant, I will deliver to you all my commands for the Israelites. And here it is, down in verse 30. And you shall set the bread of presence. King James calls it show bread. Show. Presence. Show the face. Are you seeing where I'm going? What's Jesus called? The bread of life. In other words, Jesus brings us, has brought us into the presence of the holiest of all. He's the mercy seat. That's why it calls him the mercy seat in Romans 3.25. And I've talked about this before. The Greek word there for mercy seat is hilasmos. Remember that? It's where we get the word hilarious. And that is Jesus is the sacrifice that causes God to be hilarious, to smile upon you, to shine his face. He says his anger endured for a moment under the Old Testament, but joy comes in the morning, I should say. That's why Jesus in Psalms, it, it says in your presence is what? Fullness of joy, shouting, singing, smiling, we're forgiven. God's presence is with us. So you shall put the bread of presence on the table before me, always. It will always be there. It was so important to God because it was looking forward to Jesus. John 6, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes on me has everlasting life. We have that life now, okay? We don't have to wait until we die. We have it now. That's what Jesus said to Martha. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he who lives and believes in me will what? Never die. You'll never die. You'll never die. If you're a believer in Christ, you'll never die. So this is Jesus talking. He who believes on, and he says, I am the what? Bread of life. The bread of presence. When you eat of that bread, it's him. It's Christ. It's, 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 it's not Welch's, okay? It's not Welch's. And it was like, not Dave's daddy. Yeah, that's good bread, by the way. <laughs> Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, so that a man may eat of it and not die. Him. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he's obviously clearly speaking metaphorically, he shall live forever. And truly, the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews argued with one another, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They were freaking out, right? It's like, what? Because cannibalism is strictly forbidden in the Old Testament, right? <laughs> then Jesus says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life. Whoever partakes of my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who partakes of my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me. And I just think he's talking about, this is the new covenant in my blood. When you believe in me, when you believe in my bloodshed for sin, that I'm the only sacrifice, I'm the only savior. He said, that's what God said. He says, I am God. He says, besides me, there is no savior. And so here's Jesus. He who partakes of my flesh and blood and drink, drinks my blood dwells in me. Did you see that? By the way, that's very important. He who partakes of my flesh and drinks my blood, what? 
dwells in me. What did John say? And Jesus say in the high priestly prayer to the Father. He said, I in them and they in us, right? We dwell in God and he dwells in us. That's why this beautiful picture in Revelation, that it's, it, it's, all it's speaking about is the church. So many people uh, just make it this physical thing. No, the Bible says the lamb is the temple. We dwell in him and we are the temple, Paul says. He dwells in us. It's a marital relationship. As we talked about a little bit on Thursday or uh, Sunday, where the Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Well, the two, remember, the two become one. Well, we're married to Christ. He's our husband. We're his bride. He dwells in us, right? And we dwell in him. It's just so remarkably beautiful when you meditate on the real meaning of these things, what God was trying to tell us. It's all about relationship, not religion. Amen. It's about relationship with God through what Christ has done. So he who partakes of my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live through the Father, so he who partakes of me, even he shall live by me. And that's what we mean when we say receiving Christ into our lives. This, here it is, this is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate manna and died. He who partakes of this bread, the bread of presence, the bread of life, the bread of his countenance, shall live forever. Psalm 36, verses 7 through 9. How precious is your loving kindness. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Isn't that just beautiful? How precious is your loving kindness, O oh God. And you remember before where it spoke about God being a shelter from contentious tongues? Remember that? Look at this. The sons of men take refuge under the shadow of your wing. Refuge from what? You know, gang violence, robbers are breaking. No, there have been a lot of Christians who've been killed by robbers who break into their houses. No, no, no. We don't have to fear that stuff, right? Yeah, it might happen. Okay. This is what we're now protected from. Contentious tongues, accusations. No one can lay a charge against us. And as I mentioned on Sunday to the Colfax Church, the, it's, a, it's a great doctrine which is taught all in Romans chapter 3 and 4. And it's called the doctrine of justification by faith. We've been justified in spite of ourselves through faith in Christ. He's declared us innocent, declared us justified. You're in my presence. You're clean. You're forgiven. My cross did the job and it did it well and it did it forever. Go free. How precious is your loving kindness, O God, and the sons of men take refuge under the shadow of your wing. They shall be satisfied. Are you ready? What's it? So what is a name for us, the people of God? What are we sometimes called? The church, the temple of God, and the what of God? It's a dwelling place. House, right? We're called the house of God. Hebrews 3.6. The Bible says we are his house. First Peter 2 says we're built up a spiritual house, right? It says this. Are you ready? This is so cool. Or as I would tell maybe my youth group, this rocks. <laughs> they shall be satisfied with the fatness. There's that word, right? It's full, right? They shall be satisfied with the fatness of your house. The church and you shall make them drink from the river of your pleasures. What did Jesus say in John 7? He says this, If any man believe on me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That's the river of his pleasures. That's Jesus. That's the good news of the gospel. Forgiveness. For with you, here it is, house, fatness, your full bread eating. Jesus said, He who believes on me shall never hunger. He who comes to me shall never thirst. John 6, same chapter that we were in. He says, why for with you is the fountain of life. 
in your light we shall see light. And we'll finish up with this verse. Right on time, praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Now we're coming up to Christmas and we read this passage in Isaiah chapter 9 all the time and it says this, the people is under the old covenant. The people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. And what did Jesus say? I am the light of the world. Let light shine out of darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the what? Face of Jesus Christ. Again, can I get an amen? Amen.